Hello, everybody. This is Stu Smith and Jeff Nichols, and we are doing another tactical fitness report. This time, Jeff and I are going to create the perfect bud student. <laughs> and we're going to do this from scratch because what we're going to do today is um, if you are a non athletic person, just say, I mean, you might be an athlete, but maybe you just never played sports, organized sports. Uh, there are a decent percentage of people who join our military and even into special ops that aren't your typical high school athletes, right? Maybe played a little bit when they were younger, but they didn't make a team. Um, I mean, a lot of days, a lot of teams these days that if you don't play year round sport, uh, you're not going to make the high school team, even though you're probably a pretty good athlete. So anyway, whether you're an athlete, you're a non-athlete, here's the deal. You know, you don't have to be an athlete to be in great shape and in the type of shape that you can make it through bud. So let's start it off uh, with, um, I guess we, we could go into a lot of different what ifs in this one, you know, because right. there, there are a lot of people who don't do sports because they have to work after school and earn money for their family. They have to, yeah. um, you know, they just they couldn't make the team. You know, they need to study more to make it through the courses, you know, whatever yeah, those reasons, reasons are. Yeah, there's yeah, a lot of reasons. A, just in, in, I guess, further framing is that it's, it's a, when we say it's, it's hard to define what non-athlete is, right? And that's, I guess, when I think, it, well, I, I'm going to frame it like this, and I think Stu's already kind of touched on it, is that let's say since you were 12 years old, for many of us, we would just play one sport and then another sport all through summer and school. And then you just kind of, there's some people that might start off with sports and not do, but again, just we're not trying to split hairs on what exactly we mean. Let's, because a lot of people, you know, you may have played sports in high school, but you know, to college, you were a typical non-athlete college student. Does that make you a non-athlete? Again, we're not trying to split hairs, but right. What we're trying to show you is that I think this in this timeline, this world where fitness and training and, and gyms are so prevalent, CrossFit specifically, it's kind of like you've traded one for that traditional side, and that's totally acceptable. So sure. don't don't take the idea if we're saying, oh well, I wasn't an athlete, I don't have a chance at buds. That's that's completely not the truth at all. Right. Yeah, it, it just – and to be honest with you, athletes that – specifically athletes that pick one sport and do it, do it, do it, do it, it's not advantageous for them to be a single sport athlete in that sport or in preparation for special forces. Oh, I think it's it's opposite. Um, and so that's why Stu and I keep saying, hey, if you have a chance, do a little bit of everything. And that's kind of what we're saying because you see these non-traditional athletes – you know, spending some time doing jujitsu and they might do, you know, rec softball or they just might weight train or rock climb, whatever it is, all acceptable. So yes. anyway, so getting back on track, I think, so let's, let's talk about um, the positives. Okay. What are the, what are the, what are the, the mental, po are there, are there any mental positives in being a non-traditional athlete? Let's, let's say this non-traditional athlete, just for argument's sake, let's frame him. Let's say it's a, this guy is a, this man and woman is a, they're a high school senior. Let's say that. And they, you know, they, they ran track once in high school, didn't particularly care for as a kid. They uh, played a little bit of soccer, played a little t-ball, played a little bit of this, that, and the other, but never really stuck to it. You know, they, let's say, hell, man, let's say this person worked on a farm or worked, worked as a lifeguard. That was my life. I did both. Right. Yeah. It's like, what, what, is, what are, are there any mental advantages to instead of being playing sport? Maybe this person from a young age worked. Yeah, or did did, did anything. Yep. Um, now I will say this: this is a little different than when we talk about the non-athlete who is eighty pounds overweight and plays video games all day. Yeah, big difference. I, I would say that would be a different show. Yeah. Right. We we could do that one. I've seen guys become tactical athletes from that background. Yeah. Now it took a lot more time. It yeah. took a year just to lose 80 pounds for one. And then he had to evolve into, a, you know, kind of get in better shape. So we'll talk about that one another day. This is the guy and gal that um, 
you know, just did other things besides sports. Yeah, a lot of, probably for a lot of you that are listening uh, that are 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 years old, if you were a non-traditional athlete, many of you probably did labor jobs, uh, helped carpentry, probably a lot of you did lawn work, right? Um, yeah. Like I said, landscaping, uh, you know, roofing of houses, siding, you do those, those summer jobs or those year-end jobs where you're helping somebody that's skilled, an electrician, all those sort of things. And that's kind of the world I came from, whereas a lot of my friends, that's the jobs they did, did construction and farming and those sort of things. And so that right there is, is, is about as good as experienced mentally as it is being in a sport, honestly. I, yeah. I think that now, we're again, not going not to split hairs, but I think that there's a real value at a young age working jobs, right? yes. part-time jobs, especially in the summer. I think it's a really good idea. Um, as a parent, when my son is capable and able, he will be working summer jobs, even if he's yeah. in, the, even in sports. Yeah. Whether it's mowing neighbor's grass yep. or, you know, I, I had the luxury of working on a watermelon farm nice. when yep. I was growing up. And th- that was like, <laughs> lifting, nice that was like Florida. <laughs> lifting weights all day in the sun. I yeah. mean, that was, that, that was a good, hard job uh, for us. Um, uh, but it was fun. You know, it, it, you were there with your buddies and you made 50 bucks a day. And, you know, back in the 80s, that was a million dollars. Yeah. You know, so anyway, um, the mental I toughness, think mental I, I think positive. mental toughness out of these things, you know, yep. you're on you're on a time schedule. You know, you don't want to go do these things sometimes, yeah. but you go do them anyway. So there's part of the getting comfortable being uncomfortable. Yep. Um, Especially with those summer jobs like you yep. picked watermelons. I did detasseling. Oh so yeah. Oh, yeah. That's awful. Yeah. Pulling the tassels off corn down miles and miles of rows in the hot sun. <clears throat> it's super unforgiving. So you're, I think that that I always, cause people say this to me and, and, and I get it. I just wasn't that type. They're like, Oh, should I be waking up super early to get, and I was like, well, if, if you, if I'm the type of person I can get up, I may not be super in tune, but I don't have a problem getting up. Now, if someone is just struggling, like they're just so comfortable in bed, it might be a good idea to start trying to get up early just to know what it's like. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. And, and that's what, you know, working will have to, typically most jobs will do. You got to get up early and go to work or you do them after school. But I, I think that there is a value in that. And that's where just, here's the thing. I, this all could be summarized in one sentence for me. It's never a bad idea to work hard in a job pre-military no. service. Absolutely. Absolutely. doesn't matter what it is. And you, you will come across with some great intangibles too. You know, well, like we talked about the mental toughness, but, you know, especially if, if you're doing this to, you know, help out your family, you know, I mean, there's, you can't find a better team role right there. Yep. You know, we talk about the value of team sports, but, you know, when you're helping your family meet ends, make ends meet, I mean, that's, it doesn't get any better than that, yep. you know, and, and that, that, that is some rewarding work yep. that you can take for the rest of your life and remember what you did to do that. And yeah, with that comes a lot of confidence. And I think, you know, yep. a lot of confidence uh, going into the military and especially special ops world, you know, is some very valuable tools that you will have in your backpack. Yeah, because that's one of those things, I guess, that's probably the biggest strike against an individual we say that is 18 going to going to military service is because I know Stu's laid it out in his article very poignantly. It's like, you know, you're young, you haven't experienced a lot of defeat, heartbreak, heartache, whatever it is. You've been relying on your parents typically, those sort of things. But that's, that's okay if you're 18. Yeah. But it makes it difficult when you join the military, you're away from what you know, you're in a new environment, you have all these stressors. It's kind of a recipe for failure a lot of times. Yeah. A way to kind of counteract that, in my opinion, is work and, and sports. Those are the two options. Right? Yeah. When, what else yeah. do we have when we're 16, 17? You're either yeah. going to be in sports or you should be working. Yeah. Agreed. That's, that's the kind of the way that my life, yeah. uh, it, I see it. So now on the negative side, maybe on mental – it's kind of a trade-off, you know, I think it's a perspective thing. It might be a negative in the sense of 
Well, I didn't do a team sport, but Stu's already said, hey, if you're providing resources and finances and help to your family so you can put food on the table, roof over your head, all those sort of things. Fortunately, I wasn't, I never had to deal with that, but I can understand like contributing to the family, <coughs> that's the trade off. Yeah. But there is some real, I wouldn't say these things are necessarily negatives because it, that negative of not being in a team sport can very easily be trumped by working. Yes. With a team, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's And then, you know, you're you know, you find some workout partners and you do some workouts too. I mean, because yeah. you, you can't get there without training. And we're we're about to get into the training side yeah. and you know, we're going to have to really build an athlete uh so to speak, you know, a tactical athlete out of yeah. a tradition non-traditional you know, athletic person, yeah. you know, for lack of a better term. Yeah. Um, so let's, uh, I guess, let's just start with the foundation. How, how would you build the foundation for this guy? Yeah. And so here's, here's the, here's one of the, we're, we're creating the answer for many of you of the big what if that Stu and I sometimes have. The big what if is like, well, should I be doing calisthenics? Should I do this? Should I do this? Well, it depends. Depends on, in this case, particularly doing setting a foundation with calisthenic work is probably the most optimal way to go about doing it with this individual yeah. provided again, the what if is like, well, let's assume that this individual that's 15, 16, 17, 18 years old, hasn't, he's, he's done a lot of manual labor. He's worked on farms. He's worked on landscaping. He's done those jobs, whatever it is, construction, but he hasn't really gotten into the world of resistance training. This guy that we're talking about, this hypothetical individual that we know actually exists, these people, calisthenic-based training right now is probably your best bet. Yeah, and I tell you what, there's no better calisthenic progression than a PT pyramid. You know, yeah. you, you can progress perfectly with a PT pyramid and then kind of assess yourself too, you know, along your journey as you uh, get a little bit better and a little bit better and a little bit better, but you do the same thing with your running too. Yeah. You know, you start off easy. You know, you might not run more than a mile the first time you put on a pair of running shoes, yeah. you know, or you maybe just do four quarter miles. Yep. You know, it's just, you know, and then each one of those progress and we, you know, a typical progression, you might see a 10% progression each week. It's going to take some time to be able to get up to four or five miles. For I mean, sure. you, you don't want to do that in a week. You know, that, that that's where people go wrong. And especially this person who's not used to running, maybe not used to lifting. He's going to see all those nagging running injuries that occur. Typically yep. he's going to see shin splints, He's going to see knee tendonitis on the outside, knee tendonitis on the inside, meaning like patellofemoral syndrome and IT band issues, you know, just because he's not used to those things. Now, we can probably um, help him prevent those with some logical progressions, but also adding in some leg work too. What, what kind of leg work would you add for this type of guy? I think a, a good one – is going to be is lunges forward and backward, like walking lunges. It was, yeah. is a, for me, you know, we have, we have back squats, barbell back squats and front squats, and we have running are, are there are two different ends of the spectrum as far as training is concerned, but we got it, but we can't do both all the time. I just don't I, squatting all the time. Isn't going to make me a better runner. The running all the time also has a limitations and it doesn't running doesn't help squatting necessarily either. So what's that bridge? That bridge from a movement painter standpoint is hip flexion, knee extension, all these sort of flexions, extension, anterior, posterior, and that's the lunge. Um, it doesn't have to be a heavy barbell at first. It doesn't have to be, you know, it could be uh, walking lunges with 10 pounds. It could be walking lunges with a light rucksack. It could be all sort of things. And, and, and that right there is going to in, increase ground force that you're going to increase your tolerance for ground force managing it, but also it continues to get you into deep, hip, deep hip flexion and knee extension, all those sort of things, knee flexion as well, which is you, you definitely want in running and be resilient. Um, so I look at there's this transition is like walking lunges. You know, you might want to push a sled, pull a sled, um, uh, 
Zach Evan Ash has a really good book out there called the underground strength book. Mm -hmm. uh, his, his, you're familiar with Zach yep. Evan Ash. Yeah. Yep. Zach is awesome. And he has an entire book basically on like caveman strength, essentially like sandbags and boulders and tires and like bleachers. And I, I always recommend that for somebody for you know, like a, you know, I have fathers reach out to me. I'm sure they do to you. And they say, where should I, my son has never done any weight training. Is there a good resource? And I always say Zach Amanesh's book is the one to go. I tell you what, because he usually focuses mainly on kids. Yep, that's it. Too. Man. I mean, he's he's, he's working with, with wrestling. Yeah, his two. I think he's yeah. has three gyms now, actually. But yeah. up in uh, upstate, in New, he's in New Jersey. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, and he actually have it behind me here. I think I did. Yeah, I did a podcast with him a while back. He's a good guy. Hold on two seconds. I think it's right here. But yeah, um, give me one second. Yeah. Yeah. Carry on. Yes. So anyway, some of the things that, that we are talking about here are just um, creating a good foundation. One of the things I like to do with new runners is, like we mentioned, you know, on one day we do the upper body PT pyramid, run a little bit. On the next day, we're going to do some – quarter mile runs and while we rest in between those quarter mile runs that's when we add our you know lightweight squats and lunges yeah right so we'll do a quarter mile maybe 20 squats 10 lunges per leg quarter mile do that again you might be at four or five times you know your first few times doing it then gradually you're going to progress and, and build that up into running a little bit longer a little bit more sets uh but that 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 I think is a great progression for someone who is trying to just get started, yeah. you know, barring that they're not 80 weight, 80 pounds overweight too. For sure. If they're a way overweight, I, I wouldn't even have them running. To be honest with you. I'd yeah. be doing non-impact stuff with them. But yeah. So like, again, that that's, this guy is a perfect example where they, they should be doing, cause I know you have the literature, your books on the calisthenic side of it and the, the buds prep and all those sort of things with our surround around like that, that really ethical, honest pr progression in the calisthenics and running and swimming, you should be doing that. And if you want to get kind of a little bit into um, some of the resistance with just implements, this is Zach Amanesh's book. One of them. Yep. This is the one right here that I reference a lot of times, you know, he's got, it, it, there's a ton of pictures in it too. Zach and his publisher did an awesome job. Cause it illustrates a lot of things. It just, you know, buddy carries sandbag carries. He's got pictures of him carrying Jerry cans. He's using a high school bear crawls, all that stuff. Like that's, that's the thing with athletics. That's all athletics is, is just breaking down movement patterns, applying them to like a goal, like, yeah, you know, touchdowns and touch and all those sort of like, that's the goal. But all, all they're doing is executing certain movements that improve that, that skit, you know, that, that goal. Right. And that's all athleticism is. And that, I think Zach does a good job of breaking it down in his book. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, called, again, I didn't say it. it's called the, the encyclopedia of underground strength and conditioning. Yeah. yeah. You can see his, he's got a great YouTube channel too. He does great just, YouTube just channel, yeah. good podcast. And yeah, I guess yeah. you and I both have been on him and he's just, yeah. he's such a good person too. Yeah, absolutely. So um, that's kind of, I, I see that maybe, you know, we kind of talked about, I mean, there's no real negatives on the physical because in the same sense of like, just because you haven't done it now, it's, it, it can be a little bit difficult to teach a nine, 10, 12 year old athletics, like right, to be athletic. Mm -hmm. But when you're 17, 18 years old, you have now have the neurological capacity to learn very quickly. Yes. So someone that hasn't been exposed to weight training for very much or running and this sort of thing, swimming and swimming, they'll pick it up really fast. Yep. That's so that's why I kind of like, well, you haven't learned it, but in the short, in a short six, eight weeks, six, eight, 10 week cycle, the foundation of athleticism that you can create in that 10, 12 weeks, six, eight, 10, 12 weeks around the person. Yeah. Is profound. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Especially when they're starting out at, at yeah. nothing. Right. Yeah. And their, their growth curve is huge. Um, you know, one thing that Jeff and I talked about in one of our first podcasts is we broke down tactical fitness and building the tactical athlete, especially for special ops stuff, is in two phases. 
you got a two phase and you have a through phase. And right now with this athlete, I, I think with the calisthenic base, the running, swimming, he's going to have to add swimming into this, obviously. Uh, maybe do it as a cool down on the back end of the workout, but also add some technique stuff. Um, these, this not only serves as a foundation of fitness for this guy, but it also is preparing this guy to get to the training by mastering that PST. Yep. And, and that, that's kind of the underlying goal here. One, we're trying to build a foundation for an athlete who's maybe not have some of these strength and endurance ath athletics or yep. muscle endurance athletics under his belt, but we can do that pretty quickly. But at the yes. same time, the underlying goal is to get to the training and that is mastering this PST. Yep. I would say that on the negative physical side, the two biggest negatives are, are outliers, physical outliers. And that what I mean is the guy you've already mentioned, man or woman that's, that's, that's 30 plus pounds more overweight and been fairly sedentary. Yeah. That's an outlier and it takes a little bit longer. Equally is a guy, the guy on the other side that's, you know, five, five, six, 130 pounds. Yeah. Right. That is, that picks up running very quickly. Yeah. Cause he's like, but his strength maybe not be, not be so great. <laughs> Whereas like, again, the outlier on the other side probably doesn't have much endurance, nor does he have proportionate strength to body weight. Yeah. So those two individuals might be a little bit longer. Let's say, again, I, I, I look at it, guys. I remember my high school, my father was the same way. My father was a 200-pound, like, sophomore in high school. He grew up on you know, 11 different dairy. His family's managed 11 different dairy farms. Wow. Like, he's just a big farm kid from Iowa. That's what my dad was. And he, <laughs> he, he, he was – parents wouldn't let him play football, but – the high school football coach came to him. My, my, they, he drove to my parents' house, my, my dad's house when he was in high school as a junior and basically begged <laughs> my parents, my grandparents to let my dad play football. And the agreement was this, and I can't believe it's still, it's crazy, but it just goes, shows the time. In order to get my dad to play, what he agreed to is he would bring other players from the school to help my dad do chores. My dad is one of nine brothers and sisters. And it's a big, a lot of, a lot of milking cows, a lot of feeding pigs. So some of the high school football players would help my dad do chores before and after school. So That's awesome. Practice. That is and, awesome. And my dad was all state in football for two years. Um, and then same thing in track. My dad was a 200 pound lineman. <laughs> so the, you know, the Drake relay is really famous relay in Iowa. Oh yeah. I've heard like, of it. Super, yeah. it's, it's like yeah. one world. It's not just about Iowa. It's like collegiate. Yeah. And high school students will qualify for the Drake Relays. Um, and my dad's high school, very, very small school, believe it or not, again, still, like, my dad was a big guy, but he was the fastest guy in the school. So the same thing, the track coach went to my grandparents and was like, can your, dad, can your, can your son run track? He'd never run track all season, not a, but he, they, they had him run one of the relays prior to qualifying for state and districts, and he anchored the four-by-one, and he won the 100-meter dash. Damn. never ran track and uh my mom's kind of same way my sister those sort of things but i guess my point is is that my dad was this big farm strong kid that was bailing hay milking cows and doing a lot of physical labor and transitioned right into athletics because he had developed the physical skills of strength speed and endurance and power right. Right. and so that's where like i look at it and i go guys it's okay that you don't like sports i almost don't particularly care for organized sports anymore either but I do like working hard. Yeah. And so for those of you, for those of you men and women, they're just like, man, I don't like organized sports. Hell, you may not even like people like me. I don't particularly care being around a bunch of people in crowds, but you're like, find, find something you enjoy doing. It doesn't matter what it is. Just get out there and be physical. So that's my kind of my, my the Nichols family tree story there. No, I like but, that. That, that, that is so true though. There's no, there's no, there's so many guys. I'm certainly Stu. Same with you and I. There are people on your, plenty of people in your buds class that weren't athletes. Oh, absolutely. And just kick buds in the ass. And didn't look like athletes either. I mean, they, they, they were not built like the typical yep. guy. But I don't know what they did. But they, they just gutted it out and they, they got through it. 
you know, and, yeah, and that, sure. that's, a, that's a lot to this. I mean, we're talking about all these different athletes that are going to buds and all these different podcasts that we're doing, but really in the end, you know, you have to build yourself a foundation of strength, get some muscle endurance on top of it. Right. And then cardiovascular endurance in both running and swimming. And, you know, hopefully all that you've built it up to a level to where you can get to the training then you increase the distance a little more on your timed runs. You increase the distance more on swimming with fins and you can make it through the training. That, that is really what we're talking about. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what athlete you are. We're just building that guy from scratch in this particular instance. Sure. And, I, and I would say it, it's probably going to take them a year, maybe a year and a half to fully develop into that. No, depending on, what side of the spectrum outlier he is, yeah. he's going to need to put on some weight. So he's going to have to do a strength cycle, probably a hypertrophy cycle, you know, in there just to put on some mass and then come back around and do that calisthenic cycle again and get a little faster, get a little higher repetitions and move yeah. that around. So I, I would definitely say, you know, probably six or probably six to eight, six to eight week cycles will probably get you in that zone of, you know, cycling through these, yep. all these elements of fitness, because you can't, once again, you have to be good at all of them. You know, you can't neglect all of them. Now, the cool thing about somebody who's the non-athlete is he's probably not good at any of them yet. Yeah. Right. But we got to get good at all of them. For so. sure. Yeah, and I think that this is the kind of this, that maybe a, seem like a, a silly analogy unless you've experienced it is that I have trained a lot of females shooting a lot while I was in the Navy specifically for the Navy. And then since I've done a lot of shooting instruction, uh, pistol and rifle and the women always outshoot the men. I've seen it so many uh, times. And, and the reason why is because women don't grow up with this idea of how they, they know how to shoot a gun from movies mm -hmm. or playing cops and rods or robbers or whatever you do paintball and stuff like women have no bad habits when it comes to shooting, if they've never shot boys and men have terrible habits, even if they've never shot yeah. a real gun. And so my point is, is that for an athlete that hasn't been, again, if I see a men's volleyball player, a women's volleyball player, a swimmer or a football player, and I take one look at them and I have them move, I go, you are this, you are that. Not yes. only talking size, I'm just talking how they move because of what we've been exposed to a sport, it creates certain movement patterns and compensation patterns with somebody that's just on physical labor through high school and youth and whatever, and maybe a year or two into college. And then they go, they don't have those bad habits. Yeah. And so what I see is like, because you're, if you're, we've already kind of talked about it. Let's use the, the cross country runner for an example. His movement pattern is set because of all the miles and miles and miles of that person's put into training. And so it's, it's not that they don't get strong. We have to convert that neurology Yeah, is what's happening. The muscle muscles are going to do it, but you got to convert the firing patterns of the, and the neurology into creating the decathlete type person with well, someone that's never been exposed to that. Their transition, although it's, again, you're going to see that you've seen the parallels. Hopefully if you listen to all these, we're saying pretty much for everyone, maybe other than like a wrestler, yeah, that can, can't that can swim. If you find a wrestler that can swim, good. Just go to buds. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, pretty much, if for all these other people, we're saying, hey, give it a year. Yeah, because it's not that they're not like it's not that the football player is not strong. We just haven't converted that individual into more of a, a universally uh, diverse athlete. But that same thing can be said about cross country. This thing, other. My point is, is then the person that's not been exposed to one or two sports his or her whole life. You're creating – that's why we, Stu chose those words. We chose those words like we are creating the perfect or the ideal because with this individual, if they do the training properly, like they cycle in the hypertrophy strength, power speed, work on the PST prep specifically, and then focus on their weaknesses in that year timeline, and they're not a crazy outlier, right? right. They're not 250 right. pounds and 75 pounds overweight or 110 pounds at five foot tall it's easier because they don't have the bad habits that many of us have, have developed over, over through our youth and through our um, young adulthood. Yeah. And you know, if you're learning 
weightlifting and calisthenics for the first time, typically you're going to be a little more patient and actually learn it. That's probably why the women are better shooters too, yeah. because one, they're more patient and yeah. they actually, you know, gain in more, more feedback from the instructor. So, yeah. but yeah, I, I've seen it many, many times and it, 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 I would say probably this, it, out of all the types of athletes that I've trained, I love it when I get a kid who's never done anything, needs to lose weight, and gets in good enough shape to join the military and just goes and crushes, you know, his military training. I mean, that, that to me gives me more uh, joy as a coach to watch as opposed to taking somebody who's a stud athlete and can do yep. 15 pull-ups and I get them to 25 pull-ups and running even faster. You know, I like doing that too. Don't get me wrong. And it's fun to see, and it's fun to be a part of, but to see the, the, the reward for me as a coach, to see somebody who goes from really nothing and no experience to just crushing things is, is, is very fun. It, it's, it's high up on my level of love to do's, but at the same time, I just want people to know that it is possible just because you're yeah. not an athlete, you know, and you may do other things after school besides play sports. You know, yeah. you can still serve your country and serve your country at the highest levels if you so choose. Yeah. yeah and I think that what we see this, why I, Stu and I both see this on a small scale, very universally all the time. And, and I, what I mean is that for the vast majority of the people that I train, although they know how to quote unquote swim, they're not efficient swimmers. Right. So it's like to teach somebody how to swim is takes a little bit of time a lot of patience but also when you get into get them in that groove of learning all of a sudden man like they can swim pretty efficiently in a very short timeline a couple weeks yes that that same thing happens with running and resistance training and calisthenics and all they just progress really fast if they're willing to learn yeah and 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 so like again for example tomorrow i have someone coming into town the female that's trying to go to buds and she just needs a lot of work on her swimming, but she's never, ever swam competitively, never, ever been taught. You know, it's like a single mom that she works her ass off and she, she wants to join the military. Um, and I'm like, okay, well, teaching somebody to swim who's already very athletic is actually pretty easy, especially yeah. for someone like what Stu's already said. For most of you that we work with, pretty motivated individuals. That's, that's the big, here's the big, here's the big positive. Then I'll say is that for the vast majority of athletes are pretty unmotivated I mean, right? They, in the sense of like true intrinsic, like we, and it's okay if you're playing, you know, playing sports because it's like what my friends are doing and it's how to become more popular and be accepted. And that's great. And you like it. That's a part of it too. But for any of you that want to join military service, law enforcement or fire, it's not, I mean, well, it's the cool thing to do to be a Navy SEAL now, <laughs> but it's not, it's, it, it's still fairly unpopular in the grand scheme of things. Like most people want to be playing the NFL before they would join the military. Otherwise sure. we wouldn't be having this discussion because all of our athletes that are playing professional athletics, would be doing military service right. and there would be a huge waiting line for people going to buds at that right. point. Yeah. More so than there is now. My point is, is that, you guys kind of make it fairly easy on us. Now, some of you are pain in my ass. That's okay, though. I hope, so I'm okay with that. But, <laughs> but for the most part, this is like we're just – Stu and I are just really guiding the super motivated. Absolutely. It, and here's something makes, I tell people all the time, Jeff, is it's not my job to motivate you to serve your country. Yep. You know, they yeah, come to me, yes. they come to me motivated and it's easy. It's the easiest yeah. coaching job in the world. Yes, it is. To have a motivated person. Now all I just have to do is have them finish the workouts and we're there. Yeah. That's why I tell, I tell it's fine that my running joke with my friends, cause I, I, I get offered division one, division two strength coaching jobs pretty regularly. And I tell them, I was like, Hey, no disrespect. I was like, but there are only three institutions maybe four that I would ever consider it. And I won't consider anything until my son goes away to school, but I will only consider the Naval Academy, West Point, Air Force Academy, the Citadel and VMI. 
Those oh, are the wow. only five places that I would consider going. Nice. That's it. Yeah. Because the individuals that are there want to be there. Yeah. The character that exists at the Naval Academy. Now, there are some bad apples. Sure. In the same sense of like university, Florida State University that traditionally has the lowest GPA in the planet. There are still good people there too. Sure. But again, you know, I would maybe consider Vanderbilt. I would maybe consider Notre Dame, maybe consider Stanford. Stanford, yeah. Northwestern. Yeah. yeah. Um, any of the Ivy league schools I might consider, but it's a no brainer. Like my son wants to fly my fun. My son wants to fly Raptors. So Sweet. it's like, you're going to have to go to the air force Academy. If he, <laughs> if he decides to go down that route, if he, not me, if he decides to go down that route in nine years, in nine years, I will move to Colorado Springs and I will be an assistant strength coach. And they, I don't give an intern. Yeah. That's I'll awesome. Just, I'll just go there. And, that would or, be fun. Or the NCA. Hell, yeah. I don't it matter. Yeah. Yeah, right there, right so, down the road. So, the Olympic training center is there as well. Yep. So, and I've – anyways, here's the – I'll get off my soapbox, but my point is, folks, is that if you continue to direct your enthusiasm, if you're a non-athlete, um, if you – your passion to serve, that's the beauty. And, that, and that's kind of the difference, too, is that – not to say that people that grow up playing sports aren't motivated to join the military service, but – you see this very commonly in the army in the Navy Marine Corps that a lot of guys traditionally weren't athletes, but their, their call to service trumps anything. Yep. And when that happens, it, it makes Stu and I's job very, very easy. Yeah. And we know, like, again, I say pain in the ass, like I got this really long Instagram message today from somebody who was obviously young, but he gave me like, how, what's buds like? And he asked very specific questions. He's like, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just really excited. And I really want to do this. That for me is passion. Yeah, I, I would agree. You know what I mean? I like it, it's, yeah. it's, I know what I can, I can see his little fingers. Just, I say a little, <laughs> just like mashing this thing. Got so excited because I get probably like you, I get, you know, one out of every eight messages I get. It's like, I've never, no one ever responded. I've, I've, re, I've, I've yeah. reached out to so many seals and no one's ever responded to me. I can't believe you did. I'm like, well, that's the whole idea of teaching. Yeah. Like, that's my, that's our platform. Yeah. So anyways, I, so that, that's kind of, that, that's as far, that's as close to a motivator as I get folks. Yeah, that was a good one. That was, that was that, a that's good as one. close as I get. So enjoy it. Cause it's not going to happen very often. Yeah. But my big one is this, you don't have to be an athlete to be in top shape and condition and be able to make it through buds. Yep. You know, there, there are plenty non-athletes <clears throat> or, you know, even myself, I, I wouldn't consider myself a great athlete. I mean, I played a lot of sports in high school, played some in college, but I had to work my ass off just so I could make the team. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I, I think that's where for me, sports were valuable because I, I would not have made any sports team if I didn't spend hours upon hours and weeks and months and years in the weight room to be able to be stronger and faster yeah. to be able to play these sports. Right. So for me, that's, that's where it came and it was able to parlay right into the military real easily, but that that's my path. It doesn't have to be your path, yeah. you know, but whatever path you choose and whatever path life puts you on, it requires work. Yeah. There's the common denominator right there. You're going to have to work either in the weight room Running, swimming, or on a farm, <laughs> hard, you know, manual labor, you know, doing something to make a dime, you know, that that's where it all kind of ends right there for me. Yeah. You know, we get definitely can go on and on. And I think so there should be this common theme you all are seeing is that we're saying, hey, you might have some things to work on. You may have an advantage in other things. It's going to take time, it's going to take commitment. And there, doesn't matter what you do, you have the opportunity to be successful. Yeah. Right. And so I think that we're not leaving people out on purpose. I think what the, probably the next one we're going to do is like the X games type athletes, surfers, skateboarders, BMX, skydivers, rock climbers, whatever you want to call them, yep. snowboarders, skiers, whatever. That's, that's an, that's a, yeah. we're, we're choosing to do that one because there's more and more of those individuals. Yeah. And in my buds class, we had a couple and they, crushed it yeah right some didn't some did it, it, yeah. but but again the common theme is commitment hard hard work 
and it's not, you know, although it is voluntary, you don't treat it as such. Yeah. I like so, it. All right. Uh, Until next time, Jeff. What about this? You got, you got the stupid question? What do you got? Oh, I got so many. <laughs> <laughs> I got so many. I got yeah. so many. Stupid comments, stupid questions, but you know, um, you know what? I, 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 I really, I can't even remember it. I got, I mean, I've got it. one, but it's really, it's, it's not the con. It's not so much. The, here's my recurring thing. It's it's the question, but it's the context based around the question. So I posted a a, a picture yesterday because I'm writing programs for Marsoc, for RASP, Ranger School, all those sort of things, rucking and so, so forth. And the there's there's always there's three guys that I've been in dialogue with on Instagram for a better part of like eight months, asking me every single question. And I now I'm to the point where I'm just like, I'm done. Cause he was like, well, what's, he goes, if you're writing these programs, well, are they any different than what you've put out so far? <laughs> I just wanted to be a smart ass. And just be like, no, no, I'm just, I just copied and pasted from seal fit or whatever. Wow. And like I just, so here's my point of it all as gentlemen is uh, I'm, I'm just not going to respond to, to stupid questions. Number one, it's not about me, but my point is, is we, we've said this a couple of times. If you're going to ask a question, use some common sense. Do your research. Use the again. I hate to say this, but use the extent of Google. Even if Google is going to lead you down some shitty answers, <clears throat> but what what I'm seeing with these individuals is to me is this, and we've student I've talked about it. When you feel like you need to ask, there's a difference between being motivated and excited and wanting to ask questions. And there's a difference between constantly asking the same question over and over different ways, hoping you're going to get a response that is favorable to your, your emotional state. Yeah. Stop asking questions. Just get to work. Yeah. Okay. There you if, go. If you are the, if you've asked me more than one or two or three questions, like if you're asking me questions about, Hey, this didn't make sense in your program. Am I just misunderstanding it? That's not what I'm talking about. No, I'm talking about the guy that's like goes, Hey, do we have our weekends off? Do we, do we get a travel during, this is one of my questions. Do we, do we get work at weekends off at Bud's? Can we travel when we're at Bud's? Can we go see family when we're at Bud's? All these sort of questions. I'm like, this person has no business going to Bud's. Yeah. You, you've got to understand, like, if that's a priority to you, not family should be a priority. Yeah. But if your family and high school sweetheart or who, whatever, can't realize the amount of effort and, and, and commitment it takes to be a special operator in any branch of service, then you probably shouldn't do it. Or this is going to sound cold. Maybe you should consider cutting her or him away or taking a break from your family. Yeah. Cause if your family, in my opinion, the way my family raised me and the way I raised my son, my, my family should be a source of motivation. They should be the one going, yep, you should do it. Go out there, put yourself out there. Don't worry about it. We're here to support you. We're going to be here when you're done. Go do it. But if your family or girlfriend or boyfriend's going, well, are you ever going to see me? Or, oh, man, just threw up in my mouth right now. <laughs> just be done with it, all right? I just <laughs> – I like that one. It's it's awful. It, it, it is true. I mean, you, you, you don't have time to travel on the weekends. Yes, you get Saturday and Sunday off. And Saturday you, you, Sunday you, should be spent cleaning your room. And you, need to lick, you need to lick your wounds too because yep. so, you, you're going to have them. There's a million questions, but I guess instead of saying here's a stupid question, the context of those questions, folks. I, I, have, I have one. It didn't oh. take me long to find it. All I do is scroll through my text. Let's see what you got. <laughs> took yeah. me took me 30 seconds while you were talking uh here's one so hey is there a height limit for the coast guard do you happen to know it <laughs> that's a typical one that if there is something that is a standard that is a reference material i mean think about that that is reference material me knowing a height standard in any branch of service it's would be would it be a big stretch, you yeah. know? I mean, that's, I mean, I, I guess maybe be... seven feet, maybe. I, 
<laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Well, David Robinson, seven foot two, man. He was in the Naval Academy. Seven one. Yeah. He grew six inches though. He was within yeah. standard. And then they kept him there, obviously. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, see, here's I, I thought you were gonna read the same question I got. Cause I got a question yesterday that said, I'm six foot tall. My friend tells me that I'm too tall to be a Navy SEAL. And I'm like, Wow. Where I don't know where it's perpetuated. It's not Seal Swick. It's not even in the movies. No. Where is it perpetuated that seals are these little dudes? Yeah, that and like I, I who's I this friend of yours? Some other yeah. high school numbnut that has no freaking clue? Yeah, like you I don't know? understand. Like if, if I were to say the average seal that I that I worked with size, <laughs> easily six foot two hundred pounds. Like that's the average. Yeah, yeah. I was the, when I, when I checked into my team at the command, my troop, um, I was one of the smallest guys and I was 210 pounds. Yeah. Right. Like I, it, that was, I mean, I, in my squad, in my squadron and my team, we easily averaged 220 or better. Yeah. And yeah. six, six foot. And like you, know, you always had guys that, I mean, we had one guy that was 150 pounder. Yeah. You know, yeah, we had one, five, I, 550 pounder. And we also had some guys that were six, four, 250, yeah. you know, the just, smallest guy I know, the smallest guy I worked with for years for eight, my last eight years in the teams. Um, he was just a small guy, but he was five, eight, maybe, maybe 165. He wasn't still that, that small, but that's okay. the smallest guy I know at that command. We had a guy at Bud's make it through five foot zero. Oh, man. Five foot tall. Oof. But he was stacked, too. He was like yeah, a little wrestler, he was probably, dude. He was probably I mean, 140 pounds, and that's oh, big. Oh, it was ridiculous. I, I yeah. thought for sure. I saw him first go over the dirty name. I said, there's no way this guy's getting over the probably dirty jumped, name. Probably jumped it. Nearly hurdled it. Yeah. 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 So again, I, again, again, get a little, we could go on and on. <laughs> oh, yeah. Maybe we should do another stupid questions one and just kind of get, but just, or maybe it's again, breaking the stereotypes of buds because I'm not sure where, maybe it's because of all the mileage that seal swick promotes and other people do, but I, I don't see there being an advantage of being 250. Also, there's no advantage of being 150 unless you're five foot tall. Yeah. I tell you what though, we just sent a guy, who was a stud in everything, uh, nine minute mile, mile and a half, 240 pounder, right? Yeah. No problem running, no problem swimming, PT, no problem. But you know what? He actually got kicked out of Bud's because he could not pass the O course. Wow. Like for his weight, he could not grip long yeah. enough to yeah. finish the O course. Huh. I bet probably with a spider wall at the end. Yeah, just crushed him. Yeah, that was that was the biggest challenge for me in buds at first because I was 195 or 200 pounds. Was it that it's the second to last ops because it's the yeah, spider wall oh, and then it's the over unders yeah. where the makes it the vaults. Yeah, and then it's the finish. Yeah, right. Yeah, the spider wall was tough for me just because I was like I tried to muscle it so much instead yeah, of using feet. Yeah. I'd never been taught how to rock climbing. Yeah, but it's such a short obstacle though. Like it's yeah, it, it's it's, it's bounds. Fast. Yeah. You should be on and off that thing in a couple of seconds once you figure it out. But I, I could see that. Yeah. I, I definitely can see that. But uh, yeah. anyways. So there you so go. So the next one, maybe we do the, the X Games type. That'd be fun. That'd be a fun one. I, I like yeah. that. Because we, we've had a couple of BMX guys get to and through and, you know, they, they, they were neat kids. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, do it. Awesome. Well, that's it, Jeff. We'll Sounds good. Chat with you later. All right. Take care.